Manchester United is the most successful football club in England and one of the five most valuable clubs in the world in terms of brand value. Today, the most expensive football players of the world play for Manchester United and the fan base comprises millions of people around the world. But in the middle of the last century, this great club could have ceased to exist. We will tell you about one of the biggest football disasters of the 20th century, the plane crash with young stars of United on board. You will find out what led to the plane crash at Munich Airport and whether it could have been avoided, what helped almost half of the passengers to survive that ill-fated flight and what happened to Manchester United after the tragedy. 1958. Manchester United is the reigning champion of England, the leading contender for the next championship at home and one of the favourites of the European Cup, a prestigious international tournament created several years ago. The team that the Nugget coach Matt Busby gathered around him was daring, technical, sporty and mature beyond their years. The team was nicknamed the Busby Babes by journalists because of the players' average age of 22 reflecting Busby's faith in his young team. Duncan Edwards, Mark Jones, William Fawkes, David Pegg and, of course, Bobby Charlton. Young, beautiful, successful and damn famous. These guys were front of the pages of sports newspapers. For kids from Manchester, they were idols. For workers from local factories, they were heroes. But for the Busby babes themselves, only a few things mattered. The football field, the goal and the ball. They train several times a day to perform twice a week and do what they do best, play football. In January, February 1958, it was time for the European Cup quarterfinals. The matches of this tournament took place in the middle of the working week. To put it mildly, the English Football League was not happy that Manchester United was participating in this tournament at all. Long journeys, tired players and constant requests to reschedule games of the British Championship. According to football officials, all this significantly reduced the quality of football shown by United. And since this team was the flagship of English football, this usually resulted in less public interest in the domestic championship. But this was just the opinion of football officials. Before the return quarter-final match of the European Cup against the Yugoslavian Red Star Belgrade, Manchester United coach Matt Busby asked the leaders of the English Premier League to postpone their next game in the championship to a later date. First, they needed to fly to Belgrade, behind the Iron Curtain, and the match there didn't promise to be an easy one, even though at their first meeting with United, the latter won. And then Manchester United were to play with the leading competitor in the fight for the championship title, Wolverhampton. However, British officials did not agree to Busby's suggestions and even set a condition. The homecoming deadline was Friday 3pm, whereas the game in Belgrade was scheduled for Wednesday at 8pm. Matt Busby asked Manchester United owners to book a round-trip British European Airways charter to make it back on time. The Busby Babes got to Yugoslavia without any problems. A 3-3 tie with Red Star meant that Manchester United moved on to the semi-finals of the European Cup. After spending the night at the hotel in Belgrade, Manchester United went home. The road was long. Since airplanes in the 50s of the 20th century were not as large as they are now and their fuel tanks were not so spacious, it was impossible to fly from Belgrade to Manchester without refuelling. The plane stopped for refuelling at Munich Airport. Passengers left the cabin and went to the terminal building to relax, drink coffee and smoke. Back then, smoking was widespread among athletes. After some time, all passengers were back on board the twin-engined Elizabethan airliner and prepared for takeoff. They talked, read newspapers, played cards, and the airplane entered the runway, accelerated, and then the aircraft commander slammed on the brakes. Dear passengers, we apologize. We have a minor technical problem. We will return to the beginning of the runway and try again. The commander's voice was heard from the loudspeakers in the cabin. Three minutes later, the plane started accelerating and failed again. The captain addressed the passengers for the second time, asking them to leave the plane before troubleshooting. 
It is now considered that the official reason for the two failed takeoff attempts was that of boost surge, whereby the engines over-accelerated because of the very rich mixture of fuel. At those times, this was considered the norm for the Elizabethan-class airplanes. The problem was usually solved with a slightly smoother acceleration of the vehicle. The runway is two kilometers long at Munich Airport, which is more than enough for the slow acceleration. However, on that day in Munich, a severe snowstorm began. Just when the passengers were asked to leave the plane for the second time, and proceed to the airport lounge. Most of them were sure that they would not fly that day. The footballer Duncan Edwards even wrote a telegram to his landlord, saying that he would return the next day since all flights were cancelled. But the crew captain didn't want to waste the day sitting in a hotel room in frosty Munich, and at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon, he again invited the passengers to take their seats in the aircraft cabin. Nobody played cards anymore. People were scared, and if it were their will, they would leave the plane altogether. Someone, in a panic, looked for a seat in the rear of the cabin, believing it was a safer place. Someone began to pray. At 3.03 p.m., the plane lined up at the beginning of the runway. To get off the ground, you need to gain at least 220 kilometers per hour. The airliner started to accelerate the speed. 30 kilometers per hour, 60, 120, 170, 217, 217, 217. The speed was expected to rise, but suddenly it dropped to 194 kilometers and the pilot lost control of the vehicle. As a result, the aircraft skidded at the end of the runway, crashing through a fence surrounding the airport and into a nearby house. The left wing and tail were ripped off and the right of the fuselage hit a wooden hut, inside which was a truck filled with fuel, which exploded. The bodies of the passengers were scattered over several hundred meters. Of the 44 people on board, 20 died on the spot, and there were three subsequent deaths in hospital. Among the dead were eight Manchester United footballers, three members of the coaching staff, eight journalists, two crew members, a co-pilot and a steward, one travel agent and one fan, a close friend of Matt Busby. Among the survivors was the goalkeeper of Manchester United, Harry Gregg. He was the first to come to his senses and, not yet fully realizing what had happened, rushed into the burning debris to pull out his teammates and other passengers. Manchester United head coach Matt Busby also owes his life to Harry Gregg. Although severely injured, he managed to recover and left the hospital after two months. The rising star player, Bobby Charlton, was also lucky to survive the infamous flight. He came to his senses after being flung from the plane, still strapped to his seat. And this is where the answer to one of the main questions lies. What miracle allowed half of the passengers on this ill-fated flight to survive? Seatbelts. Everyone who survived the tragedy buckled up before takeoff, but the majority of those killed neglected the safety rules. Another question to answer, to which was finally received only 10 years after the plane crash, who was to blame for it? Initially, the cause of the accident was called the error of the aircraft co-pilot, Captain James Thane. They made him the scapegoat because he was the only surviving pilot. He was accused of attempting to take off without checking the condition of the airplane. Investigators said there was ice on the wings, but that had slowed down the plane at takeoff point. But as it turned out later, there was no ice on the wings, and the real cause of the disaster was the runway that had not been cleared of slush. The airport staff simply did not remove the snow at the end of the runway, arguing that no one usually uses the entire runway for takeoff. These hundreds of meters covered by snow played a fatal role. The depth of the snow impeded gaining the speed needed for taking off. The news of the plane crash of Manchester United at Munich Airport in a matter of hours spread all over the planet. The club's management was faced with the question, what to do with the team? The head coach was confined to a hospital bed. The surviving footballers would either never be able to play football or they simply would not want to. There were even proposals to close the club once and for all. Then Jimmy Murphy, Matt Busby's assistant, stood in as manager for the injured United. 
When the plane crashed, Welsh Paul Murphy was training Wales's team and therefore he did not fly with United to Belgrade. Murphy promised that he would assemble a new team at all costs. As an exception for Manchester United, football officials lifted the ban on players moving club to club during the season. Murphy built a new team in just a few days. It mainly consisted of reserve and youth team members. Of course, such a Manchester United was not to compete with the Busby Babes, so the team quickly dropped out of the fight for the championship and didn't make it to the semi-finals of the European Cup. Remarkably, two weeks after the crash, the newly assembled team managed to beat Sheffield Wednesday 3-0 in front of 60,000 fans. The fans did not know what kind of players were wearing the uniform of their beloved United. In the traditional match programme, there were empty fields in place of Manchester United squad information. It was this match that made Bobby Charlton change his mind about ending his career, and 10 years later in 1968, he and Matt Busby, who returned after a long treatment to be head coach of Manchester United, did what they planned to do back in 1958. They won the European Champions Cup. Manchester United rose as a phoenix from the ashes and conquered again the football Olympus. If you enjoyed this video, please like it and ring the bell so you don't miss new episodes of How It Was.